Hello, everyone. I am Andy Anderson. My partner, Ike Allen, and I are the founders of Avaya University and the online community Enlightenment Village. Thanks so much for joining us. And in this event, we are talking with some really incredible fellow experts. We're talking with new thought leaders, visionaries, authors, and more who are here to inspire and motivate you to pursue the next level of your dreams. And today, our guest is Ken Gordon. How are you doing, Ken? I'm great, Andy. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. My pleasure. We're so excited to have you here. And I would love it if you just start us off by telling us, what do you do in the world? What, what's your role here? And how does that tie into New Thought? Gee, what I do in a role here. Well, you know, I'm, I'm the spiritual leader of Centers for Spiritual Living, which is based out of Colorado, uh, Golden, Colorado. We're, um, we're the home of 400 affiliated New Thought churches and centers uh, all around the world. Uh, I think we're in 22 countries now, probably reach out to a quarter million to a half million people that are considered to be members of it. And uh, essentially what we do is we awaken humanity to their spiritual magnificence and our vision is to create a world that works for everyone. And uh, my job, my role is to be out in the communities, to be talking to people, to be really driving and carrying the vision and the mission and uh, to let people know who we are and make sure that we're in alignment in consciousness. But because um, one of the things that I really recognize is that uh, what we need in the world today more than anything else is we need to awaken the collective consciousness of the majority of people. Um, most of us want the same thing in life. Uh, we want, you know, we want to be healthy. We want a roof over our head. We want food. We want education. We want access to technology. All these wonderful things. We want clean drinking water. And uh, the only reason we don't have it is because we don't have the collective consciousness to know that a lot of the neuroses that are wrapped around fear and lack um, aren't even in existence. They're just the way that we do life up until this point. So my job is to go up to the centers, to the ministers, to the practitioners, and to the congregants and really bring forward the good news that this is all possible, that we can transform and change and there's no reason why we can't, knowing that when that collective consciousness gets to a certain tipping point, what will happen is that we'll begin moving in an opposite direction from what we move in right now. And uh, that's the goal. That's the drive. And we do it through awakening to the spirituality within ourselves, to know the truth about who we are, as opposed to the, uh, the stories that we've told ourselves and that we've been told for the last thousands or so years. Mm. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing about that. And I'd love it if you dive a little deeper into a world that works for everyone. I love that. I, I it just it resonates so deeply with me. And a big part of Avaya is our mission to have this world that works for everyone and to, you know, everyone is included, nobody's excluded. And so so could you could you dive a little deeper into that? Like why that's important? Oh, I definitely could. It, it's important to have a, a vision in front of you that's larger than what you can imagine could be possible. Um, because if you don't, then what you really have is you have a recipe. And there's a difference between a goal and a recipe and, a, and having a vision. And what I know is, is that when you place an implant a vision in front of you and you keep it as your priority, you keep it in front of you uh, so that you're headed towards that light all the time, that what occurs is everything that's necessary to make it so is attracted into your life. And of course, it's not done by you as an individual. My biggest challenge is I find a lot of people who say that's impossible. How could you make that work? Everybody's got emotional baggage or, or however, whatever excuse or justification or limitation they want to come up with. And yes, they might be right. But here's the key. If you don't have something larger than yourself put in front of you, then how do you know when you awaken to it and when you walk into it? And so the purpose of a vision is to be greater than what you think you can do. And so when I talk about a world that works for everyone, uh, it, it is almost secondary whether or not it ever gets demonstrated or brought into manifestation. What's primary is that everything you do is based on that vision. So if you run across someone where it doesn't work, then it's your duty to stand up and say something to them and to point out perhaps the direction you need to go. And I don't mean through rudeness or whatever else. 
And, and one of the biggest challenges that I'm finding is that um, even in new thought, the way that we've done things in the past seem to be the way that we think we should be able to do them in the future. And so it's amazing how a lot of people really don't want to make the transformation or the change to make it work. I'll tell you what's happening in the world right now is fascinating because it's the greatest opportunity in the world. It, 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 is, it, it is the isometric exercise that's carving off what's necessary to be carved off in order to create a more, um, a, a more effective society in the way that we work and the way that we live. And I think what's happening in New Thought right now is that we're learning some new roles and some new uh, tools to be able to make it happen. Um, for years, New Thought was very silent and very quiet. Uh, we, we kind of hid ourselves away and we said, okay, well, if I transform and change my mind and change my condition in my life, then I'm helping the world because it's all based on the consciousness of the individual. The problem with that is we also believe in the unity of the whole, and that is becoming individualized instead of actually taking it out of the world around us. So what, I'm think, what I think is happening in our world right now, and what I think is happening in New Thought, is we're awakening to this ideal and this idea that we could do this in a different way. And the example that I give, for example, is um, when I see something happen in the world outside, I have to learn, and I speak for myself, I have to learn to be able to address that within the principles of what I hold to be true, which is the love, the light, the joy, the beauty of life, as opposed to being motivated from the anger so that I actually become violent in the activity and the action of the transformation. And when I do that, what I'm doing is I'm supporting the violence instead of supporting the kindness. And the metaphor I use, and it came to me one day when I was watching my, my grandchildren play, and when I watched my five-year-old, um, you know, run across the kitchen floor with a, with a pair of scissors, so to speak. And I don't think it was scissors, but I'll use that because it fits. And so I got up, I went over, and I took the scissors away from him. <clears throat> now, I didn't take them away from him, uh, and I didn't hate him. I didn't take them away from him violently. I took them away because what he was going to do is hurt himself or hurt somebody else with the process of doing that. And I need to be able to, I choose to grow into the consciousness where I will be able to deal with the world from that same consciousness, mm -hmm. which is that I'm not against someone but I'm wise enough to realize that if you keep running the way you're running with those scissors or that knife in your hand, someone's going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. and I feel it's our responsibility to do that, but not to do it in the way that the rest of the world has been doing it for so many years. Instead, to learn how to do it with a sacred heart, with love, with joy, with happiness, and still with purpose. Does that make sense for you? Yes, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. It's not being against somebody who might be about to do something that might hurt himself or herself or others. It's coming at it from a whole different level. So yes, absolutely. Um, so will you just take a moment to share with our viewers what New Thought is for the people who don't know what the term is, what the philosophy is, the history, all of that? Well, I believe New Thought's a philosophy, and I believe that it's a coming together. It's made up of uh, lots of independent churches, centers for spiritual living, religious science. It, it's made up of the Anton Group, Unity, um, uh, Universal Foundation for Better Living, Johnny Coleman Ministries. It's made up of Barbara King Ministries. There, there are lots of places where it's been organized and in place. And uh, last year, we celebrated our 100th birthday. So we've been around for a long, long time. Not as long as some, but a long time. <laughs> and, and New Thought is really, I believe that it's the original spirituality coming out. It's not based on dogma and doctrine or religion per se. It's based on spirituality. What it teaches is it teaches that um, spirit is an intelligence. 
and that that intelligence is everywhere present in everything at all times in its completeness and in its wholeness. And that the activity is to be aware of that because when you're aware of that, what you can do is you begin to try to reflect what you think spirit is. You reflect that in your behavior, your activities, and your actions, and your words and your deeds. And what occurs is all of a sudden, it's the reflection that starts being attracted to you and that you start living from. And those around you recognize it, see it, and step into it themselves. I think for far too long, we've been sold a, a bill of goods on the idea that we're separate from God. And we don't believe in duality in any way, shape, or form. We believe that there is God and absolutely nothing else. And that it is on this call right here and right now between Andy and Ken. And it's uh, in the person and the individual who's listening to this. And that it's complete. And that it's a matter of awakening to that so that what we can do is broaden our perspective and our ideas. Uh, one of our great teachers was a gentleman by the name of Raymond Charles Barker. And I can remember Barker telling me years ago um, that when, when he got frustrated or confused in his life, that he would go into his den and he would close the door and he'd say, Barker, you need a bigger idea. I think what new thought is, is new thought is a, is a, commu a spiritual community that allows people to recognize a bigger idea in their life in every area of their life, health, wealth, creative expression, loving relationship, and spiritual connectivity. And I believe that as we do that, what occurs is that we begin to make better choices because they're not based on the neuroses of our past belief system. And therefore, we open the door for new experiences and new things to happen. We open the door for a greater sense of abundance. We open the door for a greater sense of, of um, uh, health. We open the door for a greater sense of love and connection with our fellow human beings when we realize that we're not separate from them, that they, in fact, are part of the whole that we're part of, and that it's our responsibility to be able to nurture that. So what the New Thought Movement does is it provides tools and it provides an awareness that this is the reality that's going on in our world. And I, I was just in a, in a service yesterday, as a matter of fact, and I was talking about it. And one of the things that I, I find quite often when I travel around, and I travel a fair amount, is I, I find that when I ask people um, whether or not they've had a transformational healing through this teaching, just about everybody puts their hand up. And that's not because somebody gave them something. It's because they woke up to something that already existed within them and allowed it to become part of their experience. Mm. Mm, I love that. That's so powerful. I get the chills as you saying that last part, that it, that there it is right, right there. Um, so, so for people watching who aren't familiar once again with new thought, how many like centers and churches and are there in the world? Like what, you know, in the world of people, if they're interested in, you know, finding, learning more about that or, you know, joining a community, how many are there out there? I never counted. Um, <laughs> that there are a lot there. And, you know, we have to give credo and, and honor to the independents as well as the organizational ones. I mean, CSL, Center for Spiritual Living, uh, probably has 400. I think Unity has about 580, um, I think. Mm -hmm. If, any of, if anyone estimates. from Unity is listening, and I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, then there are literally thousands of independents. And th there's the Metacostal movement that's moving in there. There, People are awakening to these communities. What, I think that what we need to do is we need to look for a community that supports us and supports a belief in the wholeness of life, not a belief in the uh, sin and deprivation of life. And I think that all you need to do is Google it in most communities and something will pop up. And when it pops up, what you'll see, you give it a try and uh, see whether or not it fits you. But, you know, I, I'm looking at a, a spiritual group 
that has thrown away a lot of the older ideas that we've had in the past and instead is working on the principles of the teachings of Jesus, let's say, or the teachings of the great masters and the avatars, because they're all the same and they all come from the same foundation and gives us the opportunity to be able to be connected to it as opposed to dictated by it mm -hmm. and to awaken ourselves to that. How many churches are there? Thousands. <coughs> Pardon me. I would suggest that it's the majority of people right now, if they were willing to put down what they used to know, I think that what they would do is they would find that they resonate with something that's not new, but is showing up. And new thought's not about new thought. It's nothing new in new thought. New thought's been around since uh, Plato talking about the shadows in the cave. Um, Meister Eckhart. It, 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 it's, but the Unitarian movement has a, a large portion of new thought connected to it. It's everywhere. And when you are open to see it, you'll see it's everywhere. And that's the connectivity that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure organized religion is as important as uh, an organized mind within the individual who's willing to look for it in the first place. Mm. I'm pulling lots of like great quotes from you, especially you, you finish really well. <laughs> so there's all these little gems that you say at the end. I love it. Um, so, so for someone, you know, viewers watching right now who want to learn more about new thought, like what, what are like the practical applications of new thought in someone's life someone struggling with day-to-day -day stuff relationship issues health issues what have you what are some of like the practical things that they can take from this philosophy to help them perfect uh well first off first and foremost from we're the prayingest group of people you ever saw because you know you know in, in the bible it said uh, that um paul said pray without ceasing and I remember when I was a, a little boy in the United Church of Canada and the Church of Scotland, and I, I can remember that I was attending there. And when I heard that, I thought, oh, I don't want to do that. Because my mental picture was, oh, my gosh, now I have to be kneeling for the rest of my life. Or for that matter, like some of the great avatars sitting in a cave contemplating, you know. And, and I want to be out in life. I want to participate in life. And so... <clears throat> What we believe in new thought is your every thought's a prayer. So if I were to give every, the most I could give to anybody, and, and I mean, obviously, you've got to go through that with exercises along the lines of learning to love yourself, self-appreciation, self-esteem. You have to, to learn to forgive. You have to learn to surrender. You have to learn to uh, let go of your old ideas. You have to learn to throw away your cynicism. You have to learn to open yourself to the possibilities and the potentials as opposed to being stuck in the, uh, the rut of, or, or as Don Miguel Ruiz says, the metote of life. You have to question everything, but at the same time, you have to question it with, a, with an awareness and a love and a light and a, and a real curiosity within you. And those are the tools that we bring into it, but the greatest gift that can come from it in my personal belief of which I have a very high opinion, the, the greatest opinion that, that thing that I think that we can teach people to do is we can teach people that what they put out into the universe, what they put out into life continues to grow and expand. And if you put out anger and angst, if you put out hatred and you put out withholding and all the different defense mechanisms we use, and what you're going to do is you're going to find that boomerangs on you and comes back and you get to participate in it in your own life, in your own way. Mm -hmm. And that you are the creator of it so that if when you can give love out, you'll get love back. When you can give joy out, you'll get joy back. So what are the tools? The tools are how to think differently about life and how to approach life from that different manner in a way that still works for you and allowing other people to have it work for them as well. Mm, got it. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. So, so how do you think, 
you know, how do you think New Thought has changed over the years? You know, we first met you, gosh, I think like six, seven years ago now. Like what, what's changing? What's evolving? And that's one of the, my favorite things about New Thought as a whole is just evolution. It is, is accepted and embraced and right, that's all part of it. So what's evolving in New Thought? How's it changing? It's consciously evolving, that's for sure. Um, there's tons of stuff that's changing. You know, you know our, our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of Religious Science uh, Centers for Spiritual Living, our founder, Dr. Holmes, um, used to start a radio show, and he'd start the radio show the same way every week out of Los Angeles, and it would be, there is a power in the universe greater than you are, and you can use it. And, and I think that what's happening and what's elevating in our world right now is we're beginning to move into that area of our life where we're beginning to realize in the evolution of consciousness, we're beginning to realize that that is true and there is a power that is greater than you are and it can use you. I think what's occurring in new thought is new thought is beginning to move from the mental science into the emotional and the spiritual science that goes with it. And beginning to understand that it's not just about the individual, that in fact, although that's a big part of it, and you certainly, that's, that's what you have control over, but also that this power that we sometimes refer to as God or spirit is a power that has the ability to do the transformation through you if you're open and receptive to it, as it acts through you, because it's part of you. It, it's always there. It's always within you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. So, yes. so let's project into the future. What, what, how do you see, where do you see new thought in the next right 10, 20 years? Well, I think that I, it depends if you're, if we're talking organizational structure, I, I think that there's a whole thing that's happening there as well. Um, you know, I, I believe that, People are seeking spiritual community more than ever, but they're not aware of it yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I think with the advent of the internet and the online possibilities that existed, I mean, it's wide open. Uh, you can get anything, anytime, anywhere from there right now. And uh, I, I believe that what's, what's occurring though is, is that if people experience that, they begin to realize that that recipe looks really, really good, but it's missing something. And the missing something is that sense of spiritual community, spiritual connection. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that in the new thought movement, what will happen in the future is a lot of our centers and a lot of our bricks and mortar churches are going to be addressing spiritual community at a higher level than they've ever done before. But then we also have an awful lot of ministries that are operating, we call them focus ministries, that are operating on an individual one-to-one, -one, how do I deal with these circumstances around us? And my understanding and appreciation of it is that they too are reaching huge audiences and touching people's lives. So I think that what we'll probably see in the structure of churches in the future is we'll probably see a different form of critter than we've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. I, I have to uh, give you a little anecdote. Um, uh, Bishop Carlton Pearson, who's a friend of mine, uh, when he discovered new thought and came over from the evangelical side, uh, uh, when he discovered new thought and walked into the Agape Center with Michael Beckwith for the first time, um, you know, he was blown away. And his statement was, they have mastered the massage, we've mastered the message. And, and I think what's happening for the first time in the history of the world is the massage and the message are actually coming together. Mm. And I think that when we see that occur, um, you're going, that's going to be the collective consciousness. That's going to do the transformation that we're looking at uh, around the world. When we have the ability to be able to move and motivate humanity um, based on what their resonant belief is and the truth is, I think you're going to see the real opening of a world that works for everyone. And so I believe that New Thought's purpose in that is to continue to nurture that and nourish that as much as possible. You know, um, New Thought in its entire 
history has been a cutting edge faith. It's been a cutting edge belief system. It hasn't been on the trunk. It's been out on the skinny branches the whole way through. And if you look at what's happened in the world over the last uh, 200 years, let's say, you'll see this dramatic transformation and you'll see how new thought affected it all the way through. Um, you know, if you go back in the history of new thought and you go back to people like Emma Curtis Hopkins and Ernest Holmes and the Fillmores, and you go even prior to that, to some of the great sages that, that were before that, what, what you see is you see this idea burgeoning and being built out of it. And as it's being built, it, it keeps attracting the muscle and the sinew to create the form that comes from it. And what we're looking at right now, there, there's a lot of people who think that uh, centers and churches or organized religion is dead um, because there's such a falling away of people. But they're not falling away for any other reason than the fact that they're falling to something. And they, in turn, will eventually come back in order to find that spiritual community and that connectivity. And I, I foresee a world that... Uh, that is probably more spiritually attuned in the future than we've ever been in before. Mm. And I actually see it all over the place. I'll tell you, Andy, is that when uh, my wife and I started our church in Kelowna, British Columbia, um, 26 years ago. But when I came here, and this was my hometown, it was both of our hometowns, so this is where we were raised. But we'd taken all of our training, six years worth of training down in Southern California with Dr. Tom Costa from Palm Desert. And so when we arrived back in Kelowna, I remember coming in and I remember thinking, um, oh my gosh, you know, we know we've learned so much. This is going to be so great. We're going to be able to teach people about spiritual mind treatment, teach people about affirmation, teach people how if they get a new idea, they'll have a new experience, teach people how to forgive and let go, teach people to uh, be more resonant, teach people about the energy that the truth they are, etc., etc., etc. And so we just started up, and the first class we ever gave, we gave in a three, grade three classroom in Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada small town British Columbia and I remember we walked in we rented this classroom and uh, I had eight students and they're all sitting at these little tiny grade three desks uh, with their pens ready to get it and I thought oh my gosh am I ever smart this is going to be so great we're going to blow them away and I walked into the classroom and I stood in the classroom and I looked up and around the balance of the ceiling all the way around the classroom was everything that I had to teach them being taught to the grade three students. Mm. It was all laid out there in, in, in their own language, mm. in, in affirmations, in quotes and statements that they put up there. And I realized at that point that the evolution of consciousness exists within our children and they can't help it. So our job is to nurture it, to keep it alive and keep it going and support it and uh, recognize that we have to run as fast as we can to stay in front of them as teachers because they already know more than we know the mere fact they're in the classrooms. That's is that right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that's so true, right? They know so much more so fast and, and how much we can learn from them, you know, ongoingly. So, um, Hey, could you just do a quick explanation of spiritual mind treatment since you, you threw that out there a couple minutes ago? And I'd, I'd love to, you know, dive into that a little bit. What is that? Okay, that's, a, that's our version of affirmative prayer. Um, and what it is, is it is, uh, well, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you the way that I learned it. It's five steps. The first step is uh, recognition, which, which basically is, I believe in God and absolutely nothing else. And you can put any name you want on it. You know, I, I know only too well how offensive the masculine name of God can be. So you can call it anything you want. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's Andy and absolutely nothing else. There's bingo and absolutely nothing else, whatever it is, but, but whatever you want to do, you can do that. The next one is to consciously unify yourself with it. So <clears throat> there's God and absolutely nothing else. And I am unified with this power. This power and I are the same. The next one is to 
really put your realization or what it is that you want into activity. So it is, um, I believe in God and absolutely nothing else. I know that I'm unified with this power. And I speak my word right here and right now for this uh, wonderful Zoom session we're having, knowing that it is a divine outpicturing of the brilliance of life and that it transforms lives. Then, as Jesus' master teacher said, you know, uh, you give thanks before you get it. And then, so what you say, and I am grateful that this is so. And the next step is to surrender it and to release it and let it go, which means you turn it back over to that higher power within you and around you and allow that to become your manifest experience. S knowing that when you've completed that, that your entire life has been changed at depth and that everything that occurs from that moment forward is a manifestation of that statement to bring it into fruition and bring it into wholeness around you. Now, it's really easy to give five steps and tell you how sweet that is. <laughs> the teaching teaches you what it really means. And every one of the steps is of paramount importance. So that that opening recognition and realization or that opening recognition is really the recognition of your oneness with life itself and after four or five years of studying that <laughs> one day you awaken and say hmm i think it is or you could be like like my teacher tom costa where he said you know i was in religious science for 20 years before religious science was in me so it takes a matter to draw it in mm -hmm. The unification is another meditative act. So the, the first two steps, the recognition and the unification, are contemplative and, rec and meditative steps to get there. When I first started to learn, I would spend a day on each one of them. The third one is to be really clear on what it is that you want. You know, you know um, if you ask the average person what it is that they want, they'll tell you what they don't want. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, uh, what, what is it that you would like in your life? I want the pain to go away. What is it that you want in your life? Uh, I want the pain to go away. No, what, what would the alternative be? And so that's the difference in the transformation in how you think. You stop thinking in terms of what it is you don't want. You start thinking in terms of um, putting form to what it is you do want. Mm -hmm. And then the, the gratitude is going back to the first two steps. It's the realization that it's already there and that you're not missing it. You know, it's the old, um, if, I, if I were capable of totally releasing my past, everything that's ever happened to me to this point, and totally releasing my future, everything that I'm anxious about is going to happen in the future, and bring myself into the present moment 100%. In that present moment, there is nothing but the perfection of spirit moving through you constantly and consistently. Everything else is created by your historical um, experiences and your expectations of what may or may not happen in the future. That's why meditation is about stilling your mind and coming into the present moment. Mm -hmm. The final step is the surrender. And the surrender is a huge one. Um, if, if I were to ask my wife right now to bring me a glass of water, um, odds are pretty good she would bring me a glass of water. And I wouldn't be required to have to run upstairs and tell her how to do it. She would know, and I would have the faith and the trust. When I turn something over to spirit, we have to practice having that same faith and trust in spirit than we do in somebody else. Mm. Because I, I've sometimes caught myself where I trust somebody who I've asked to do something more than I trust the divine infinite presence of spirit and God in the world around me. Mm -hmm. And how insane is that? <laughs> and yet that's what happens. And so those are the, that actually answers your question of what we teach too. Those are the practices that we ingrain in our life and in our body.
Thank you. That, that's perfect. I love it. We get some practical application for, for people wanting to explore this more and, you know, apply it in their life. So I love it. So this has just been amazing to reconnect with you and, and to, to be in this space with you again, Ken. It's been, it's been a while. And I, are there any last insights, anything that you feel has been left incomplete, any last insights around New Thought or really anything? The only thing that I want to state is that life is good. And, you know, I know it, but, you know, we've, we've had a little bit of trauma for the last few years, it appears, in the world around us. Uh, things seem to be happening on an escalating level. And uh, I, I'll use a quote that I, or not even a quote, um, I'll use a statement that I picked up from William Meter, who's the head of the Theosophical Society, or was the head of the Theosophical Society on a call that I saw him on one day. And, and, and what he said was, you know, um, there is a light, there is a bright light that exists within all of us. And we have to understand that the brighter the light, the bigger the shadow. Mm. And that appreciation <laughs> helps me so much in my life. Life is good. People are good. And when we begin to recognize and realize that, we'll stop seeing it be a problem or a challenge to face, and we'll start seeing it as an opportunity. And when we recognize it as an opportunity, that's when the transformation occurs, and that's when the collective consciousness shifts. God bless you, Andy. Know you're loved. Thank you so much, Ken. I love you, and thanks so much for, for being with us here today. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Ken's class, and we'll see you on the next one, everybody. Take care. Yay. Thank you. Wow. That was a beautiful ending. Woo. Good stuff. <laughs> hey, everyone. I just wrapped up another great class with Ken Gordon. And I want to start this wrap up by just mentioning what he said at the end. Life is good. So instead of looking at it as a challenge, like Ken said, look at it as an opportunity. I think if we all just took this one simple statement and brought it out into our day and then into our future, what would change in our world, right? How would our world look different? So I just thought that was an incredible way to end this and wrap this up. I know I wanted to make a quick note also of spiritual mind treatment that we talked about with Ken. And one of the steps is looking at what is it that you want? And he mentioned in there that a lot of times when someone asks us what we want, or if we ask ourselves what we want, we answer with something that we don't want. Well, I want, you know, I don't want to feel any more pain anymore, right? I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to get my heart broken, all these things. So, you know, look in your life and what are areas where you're asking yourself what you want and you're answering with what you don't want. So just a little food for thought in, you know, shifting your mind around that because when you really get clear about what it is that you want and not focusing on what you don't want, that is where, you know, manifestation occurs. That is where things come into our life. That is where things shift for us. So just a little, little food for thought there. And then he talked about the greatest gift in the teachings of new thought. And I wanted to touch on that is what you put out into life grows and expands. So like he mentioned, if you put out hate, if you put out withholding, if you put out sadness, these emotions, these ways of being will come back to you, right? It's a boomerang effect. They will come back to you. In contrast to that, if you're putting out things like love and gratitude and appreciation and kindness and all of those things, those things will come back to you. And maybe this is, maybe these aren't new thoughts for you. Maybe this is something you've been practicing for a long time. So this is not new news to you, but I think this, this is a great reminder for all of us. All of us could use a reminder around this particular thing because how often do we get wrapped up in something and, you know, put something out like hatred or disgust or something out into our world and then have the experience of that coming back to us. So just a little reminder and something to, to keep in keep keep in the forefront of your consciousness today. And thanks so much again for tuning into this latest class. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.